During the Starship integrated test flight last month, at T plus 27 seconds, Super Heavy Engine No. 19 lost communications concurrent with some kind of energetic event that damaged the nearby engines. At, so, so, so something bad happened at uh, T plus 27 seconds because uh, Engine 19 lost all communications um, and, and some kind of explosion happened uh, to, to uh, knock out the heat shields of Engines 17, 18, 19, and 20. The, the rocket kept going, though. According to Elon Musk, starting with Booster 9, the super heavy engines will be heavily shielded for protection from such kinds of energetic events or explosions. The Ring Watchers recently shared a series of tweets explaining how SpaceX isolates and protects all 33 engines of the booster from high energy events. With the help of those tweets, let's discuss the ingenious techniques SpaceX employs to isolate the booster engines. Primarily, the Raptor engines on both boosters and ships are protected by stainless steel covers and many areas beneath the vehicle are covered in black material, which could be related to the extra heating in that area. The outer 20 engines are separated by stainless steel panels, with walls mounted perpendicular to the interior face, protecting each engine from the engine next to it in case of an anomaly. The thrust chamber, turbo pumps, valves, and pipes are protected by two pieces of stainless steel plates, fitted around the top of the engine bell. 20 curved panels on the exterior cover all of the exposed parts of the outer engines, except the engine bells. 20 more curved panels cover the unprotected engine components in the interior of the aft section. Just like the outer engines, all 13 inner engines have shields fitted around the top of the engine bell. However, they look different from the shields installed on the outer engines. After the inner engines are installed, additional shields are added around the turbopump region to protect against anomalies. Those shields can swivel when the inner engines perform thrust vector control to steer the rocket. Every other exposed area inside the aft section has covering plates that feature the black material layer. These plates protect the pipes, wires, and other components inside the aft section. All the protective shields will ensure that each booster engine is isolated and protected from the engine next to it in case of an anomaly during flight. In this way, even if a couple of the booster engines explode during flight, the remaining engines can continue to propel the rocket into space. Repairs to the orbital launch site and tank farm are quickly progressing at Starbase. Earth work on the launch mount foundation is underway, as damaged rebar, concrete, and dirt are being removed. Once the damages are fixed and the launch pad is back in its original shape, SpaceX will install a sandwich of steel plates and a water deluge system to withstand the energy released by 33 booster engines during liftoff. Let's analyze how this massive water-cooled steel plate system works with the help of graphics designed by Ryan Hansen Space. The system will run water through steel plates installed underneath the orbital launch mount. The top plate has holes through which water will be discharged under the launch mount. Water will cool the metal surface and simultaneously absorb energy from the booster engine plume. In addition, the water released will act as a wall between the plume and the steel to prevent it from heating up to the melting point. Additionally, by releasing the water from the plates, SpaceX can stop worrying about it boiling and causing steam inside the plates. If that were to happen, it could theoretically cause a blowout of the entire system. To safeguard the steel plates and the launch pad, the water ejected from the plates should be at a higher pressure than the pressure produced by the booster engines. There is a possibility that discharging water at high pressure could create a fountain from all the holes, and it could affect the booster and its engines. According to Ryan Hansen Space, there is a possible solution to this problem. Installing a diverter that directs the water horizontally instead of vertically will avoid a high pressure fountain under the launch mount. Moreover, high-pressure water traveling horizontally will help create the water barrier between the plate and the booster plume. Another benefit of the diverters is that they can seal the plates when not in use to prevent damage from foreign objects. Currently, there are no storage tanks near the launch mount to store and supply water to the deluge system. We can expect SpaceX to build a water tank in the area behind the launch tower in the near future. These are water hammer absorption tanks designed to protect the pipelines from a phenomenon called water hammer. Please check out my previous update to learn more about the water hammer absorption tanks. Link in the description. On May 6, Lab Padre cameras spotted SpaceX teams setting up several pieces of hardware near the orbital launch mount. One was a foundation drilling rig that bore large holes deep into the ground to insert structures such as concrete piles. Huge casing pipes were also delivered to the launch site on May 6. The piling rig first drills a hole and inserts the casing pipe into it. The next step is to lower steel reinforcement into the hole and pour concrete into it. Later, the casing pipe will be lifted from the hole. The pile driver began its work on May 8, drilling several holes around the launch mount. 
After the first hole was drilled, the casing pipes were lowered into it. Two days later, a huge rebar was inserted into the drilled hole. Immediately after that, concrete was poured to complete the pile, which will act as a steady support for structures that will be built on top of it. The second rebar installation and concrete pouring happened on May 11th. More concrete piles will be added in the coming days. Two weeks ago, teams removed several launch tower claddings that were damaged during the orbital launch attempt. The claddings were reinstalled recently after fixing the damages incurred. Now let's take a look at the status of the Starship and Super Heavy prototypes currently under construction. Starship 25, the successor of Ship 24, is at the Massey's test site, and the prototype recently underwent what appears to have been a successful cryoproof test. Ship 26, which lacks heat tiles and flaps, is near the rocket garden. The ship received all its Raptor engines last month and is now ready for static fire tests. Ship 27, which also lacks heat tiles and flaps similar to Ship 26, is at the rocket garden. Ship 28 is now fully stacked and is inside the high bay. Next to Ship 28 is Ship 29. The nose cone payload bay assembly of Ship 29 was stacked atop the forward dome section on May 5th. After a week the entire stack was lifted and stacked on top of the common dome section. The primary structure of Ship 29 will be completed with two more stacking operations. The fully stacked Booster 9 is inside the Mega Bay, and it received all its Raptor engines last month. Its successor, Booster 11, is currently being stacked next to it. The next Starship orbital mission, repeating the same mission profile planned for the first integrated test flight, will use Super Heavy Booster 9, but SpaceX has not decided which of the Starship upper stages will fly. Now, let's discuss some of the biggest updates in the world of science and technology from the past week. BAST, a pioneer in space habitation technologies, announced their plans to launch the world's first commercial space station, called Haven 1. Scheduled to launch on a SpaceX Falcon 9 rocket to low Earth orbit no earlier than August 2025, Haven 1 will initially act as an independent crewed space station, prior to being connected as a module to a larger vast space station currently in development. Haven 1 will be 10.1 meters long and 3.8 meters in diameter, sized to fit inside a standard Falcon 9 payload fairing. The 14-ton module will provide 70 cubic meters of pressurized volume and 15 kilowatts of power. The module has a docking port at one end and a large window at the other. Haven 1 mission will be quickly followed by Vast 1, the first human spaceflight mission to Haven 1 on a SpaceX Dragon spacecraft. The vehicle and its four-person crew will dock with Haven 1 for up to 30 days while orbiting Earth. The Dragon spacecraft will remain powered the entire time it is attached to Haven 1, providing some of the consumables such as air or water and other services needed to keep humans alive. Vast opted to start with the smaller Haven 1 station so that it could start flying sooner on Falcon 9 rockets and demonstrate to its customers and NASA the viability of its hardware. The company's long-term goal is to develop a 100-meter-long multi-module spinning artificial gravity space station capable of hosting 40 people. The space station, which the company intends to launch into a 500-kilometer orbit, will be assembled in space with seven modules that will be launched atop SpaceX's Starship rocket. Vast said that the company would be operating dozens of artificial gravities and zero-gravity space stations across our solar system in the future. A Rocket Lab Electron rocket successfully launched a pair of NASA Tropics CubeSats designed to monitor the development of tropical storms. The Electron lifted off from the company's Launch Complex 1 in New Zealand on May 8, and 35 minutes later, the rocket's upper stage placed the CubeSats into a 550-kilometer orbit, inclined 32 degrees to the equator. Time resolved observations of precipitation structure and storm intensity with a constellation of small sats, or tropics, is a constellation of four identical CubeSats designed to observe tropical cyclones from orbit. The satellites will be able to monitor tropical storm development using a microwave radio meter that can collect temperature and water vapor profiles. With four satellites, tropics will be able to get hourly updates that can aid in monitoring the formation of hurricanes and other tropical weather systems. Tropics was originally a six satellite constellation. The first two satellites were launched on an Astra rocket in June last year, but failed to reach orbit when the rocket's upper stage ran out of fuel and shut down prematurely. Astra subsequently retired its rocket 3.3 launch vehicle, forcing NASA to find a new way to launch the remaining four satellites. The agency selected Rocket Lab in November 2022 to launch them on two dedicated Electron missions. If all goes according to plan, Rocket Lab will launch the final two Tropic satellites on May 16. On May 9, Rocket Lab signed a deal with NASA to launch the Starling mission, a multi-CubeSat mission to test and demonstrate autonomous swarm technologies. 
spacecraft swarms refer to multiple spacecraft autonomously coordinating their activities to achieve certain goals. The six-month NASA Starling mission will use four CubeSats in low Earth orbit to test in space network communications, onboard relative navigation between spacecraft, autonomous maneuver planning and execution, and distributed science autonomy. The Starling mission will test whether the technologies work as expected, what their limitations are, and what developments are still needed for CubeSat swarms to be successful. The CubeSats will fly in a sun-synchronous orbit more than 180 kilometers above Earth and no more than 270 kilometers apart from each other in two formations. The four Starling CubeSats will be launched on an Electron commercial rideshare mission scheduled for liftoff in the third quarter of this year. China launched the robotic Tianzhou-6 cargo resupply ship to the Tiangong Space Station atop a Long March 7 rocket from Wenchang Satellite Launch Center on May 10. After separating from the Long March 7's upper stage, the Tianjo-6 spacecraft deployed solar arrays and started firing thrusters to fine-tune its approach for docking at the Tiangong space station. Nearly eight hours after launch, the spacecraft arrived at the space station and docked at the station's aft docking port. Tianjo-6 is the sixth flight of China's resupply ship to the Tiangong space station, which orbits over 370 kilometers above Earth with its three-person crew. The spacecraft is packed with clothes, drinking water and food for the space station crew members. Also aboard are 700 kilograms of science experiments and 1.7 tons of propellant, 700 kilograms of which will be transferred to Jiangong to allow the outpost to continue maintaining its orbit. Tianzhou-6 also marks the first mission for a new and improved version of China's robotic freighter. For example, Tianzhou-6's pressurized cargo segments can accommodate about 500 kilograms of payload than previous iterations of the spacecraft. This added capacity allows China to now launch resupply missions to Jiangong every eight months on average, as opposed to every six months with previous vessels. At the end of the Tianzhou-6 mission, Chinese astronauts will pack trash into the cargo spacecraft for disposal during a fiery re-entry back into the atmosphere. Tianzhou-6 is the first of three missions scheduled to launch to Jiangong this year. The other two are Shenzhou-16 and Shenzhou-17 crewed missions, which are expected to lift off this month and toward the end of the year. Thank you for tuning in for the latest science news and Starship updates. If you enjoyed this video, please hit the like button, leave a comment, and share it with your friends. Also, don't forget to subscribe to the channel and turn on notifications so you never miss an episode.